Today we're going to be discussing developing and implementing lease privilege security for Dynamics 365 for finance and operations. Um, go ahead and introduce uh, myself. Um, my name is um, Alex Meyer. I'm the director of Dynamics AX and 365 for finance and operations at FastPath. Uh, my contact information is up there um, as well as I have a, a blog um, where I specifically write about educational um, information uh, from both uh, comparing finance and operations security to AX2012 security um, um, as well as just comparing the, the two systems and, and noticing things that um, that are different between the two. Um, and I also have my GitHub on there because we'll be discussing uh, some open source uh, things that I have published out to the community as well. I've been dealing with AX for over five years uh, in finance and operations, specifically for two and a half, um, dealing mostly with security on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Frank to introduce himself as well. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, my name is Frank Bukovitz, uh, Director of Strategic Partnerships with FastPath. Uh, in that role, I spend a lot of time uh, working with the many audit firms that are using the FastPath solutions out there to provide services to their clients, especially around supporting external audits, internal audits, and SOX prep work, uh, where they're using the FastPath SOD tool. Uh, but I also work a lot with the implementation partners out there as well. They're identifying places where the FastPath solutions can add value to their clients from a security audit perspective. Been working with the product going back to the days of Exapta 3.0 in 2002 uh, on the customer side, and proud to be one of the founders of AXUG way back when in 2003 as well. So looking forward to today's webinar. Thank you, Frank. So a quick agenda for today, uh, what we're going to cover uh, from a technical standpoint, we're going to be looking at uh, the security model overview from a finance and operations standpoint, uh, looking at what the security model entails, and I'll be trying to point out some differences from an AX2012 to 365 and operations uh, perspective. Uh, we'll be looking at the standard security reporting out of the box uh, from finance and operations. Uh, and then we'll really be looking at uh, how we're going to go about looking at least privileged security. So we're going to be looking at how we're obtaining menu item information from particular tasks that a user is performing. Uh, we're looking at uh, other features that uh, finance and operations uh, provides, like the security diagnostic tool, the role test workspace, the task recorder, and using those tools, how we can actually get to a point where we can develop um, that least privilege um, type of security. And then we're going to look at, um, Frank is going to look at it from the audit perspective and take a step back and say, okay, why would we actually go about implementing it and why auditors are actually going about uh, looking at it, um, le uh, implementing least privileged security. We're going to look at a real use case scenario from a user uh, that actually posted on the AX user group forms online um, and, and how we went about actually helping that user to um, implement least privilege security. We're going to look at you know defining the steps that uh, we at FastPath go through when we're helping a client uh, go through this and then we're going to answer any questions you guys have. All right so when we're looking at implementing least privilege security the first question that you have to ask is why is it important um, and there's three main reasons that we look at from that perspective of why it is important. Uh, the first would be an environmental risk. If user um, has more access to an environment than they need, they may in intentionally or inadvertently uh, perform actions in that system that could put your company at risk, both from a segregation and duty perspective or a financial perspective. They could be going in and performing those tasks. Um, and again, they may not mean to do that or they may mean to do that, but uh, you're opening yourself up to that risk just by having that user have more access than they need to to perform their day-to-day -day operations. Um, the second thing is from a user licensing perspective. Uh, because security and licensing are tied so closely together in AX and, finance and 365 for finance and operations, um, by limiting the amount of access that you're giving users and roles, you're going to ensure that your licensing costs are uh, being uh, minimized uh, from your company and saving your company money from a licensing perspective. Um, if you're over-provisioning users, you could be costing your company money uh, because you're overpaying from a licensing side. And then finally, we kind of mentioned this in the first bullet point as well, but from a cigarette chain duties perspective, um, you know, if a user has more access than they, needed, than they need, 
uh, they may also have unneeded segregation of duties. So you may spend more time and effort trying to mitigate those segregation of duties, or they may go unaddressed uh, from um, you know, not being uh, actually either you know, taken care of from a security standpoint or from a mitigation standpoint. Um, and so both of those situations can lead to problems from an internal external audit. All right, so uh, for anybody who has used the uh, AX 2012, early versions of AX or finance and operations, this picture should look fairly familiar. Um, this is the um, graphical display of what the security model looks like. Obviously, it's a role-based security. From the top down, at the highest level, you have your roles. Those are what are, get assigned to users. Um, underneath roles, um, at the role level, you have, uh, you know, these represent a job function that a user would perform, things like accountant, accounts payable, things like that. Um, underneath those are made up of any number of duties and privileges, and these are just categories of other um, uh, processes um, that a user could perform. Uh, duties are the next layer down. These are general tasks that a user would perform, things like approving customer invoices, maintaining a budget plan, um, and these duties are made up of any number of privileges. And the privileges are the most granular security layer uh, where object uh, assignment also occurs, and they represent a very specific process that a user would perform. So adding a, a bill of materials line, editing a customer, things like that. Um, and then like I mentioned, the privilege layer is also where, table, or where object assignment occurs. So you're looking at where menu items and tables are assigned, data entity service operations, things like that. Um, in a perfect world, right, you would have your roles at the top, roles would be contained to duties, duties would be contained to privileges, and privileges would be assigned to objects. Obviously, um, you know, you're not always going to live in that perfect world, and so um, you'll notice that you can assign privileges directly to roles, uh, you can assign tables directly to roles as well, um, so there are other ways that you can do assignments, um, and both of those ways are actually, we'll discuss later on, how you can circumvent segregation of duties as well. Um, the out-of-the-box segregation duties from Microsoft, but um, you know, in a perfect world, you would have this nice hierarchy that Microsoft describes. Um, it's a pessimistic security model, so users have no access until they're actually assigned an object, uh, and um, you know, you still have additional ways that you can restrict security through things like XDS, um, and to you know restrict um, additional. Um, apply additional restrictions down by sales territory and organizations. Um, one of the big steps forward that Microsoft provided with 365 Finance and Operations was, this, was the reporting side. Um, so for those who have used AX2012, you know that out of the box there were very limited reporting uh, rep uh, capabilities around uh, security um, and licensing and things like that. Uh, they had the security development tool that you could uh, implement in and get some of this, these reports, uh, but now Microsoft has made these reports out of the box standard. No, you don't have to do anything to get these. Uh, so the standard re reporting that you can get um, is to be able to go to any role due to your privilege. You can go into user interface under system administration, security configuration, and view permissions, and be able to get an entire hierarchy uh, of the roles, duties, and privileges to be able to see what um, that role due to your privilege has access to. And so you're able to get that entire view uh, from the role all the way down to the object and including the license tied to that if, it, if it's applicable um, in one report. Uh, and so that's out of the box standard functionality um, that Microsoft now provides. Similarly, um, you can also go to the AOT uh, and by the AOT, I mean your development box, um, or go to your Visual Studio side, um, which is a modified version of Visual Studio that has a Dynamics 365 menu that you can go to that has an add-in um, drop-down. Uh, underneath that is a view-related object and licenses for all roles, uh, and this will actually run the report that we just looked at in the user interface, uh, but it runs it for all roles in your system at one report. Um, and that report will get dumped out um, to an Excel document um, in one go. So it's a large uh, report, obviously. Um, in the latest version that I ran it in, it's over 200,000 rows. 
uh, but it's the only place that you're able to go and get an entire output of your security in one place. Uh, and so I uh, just wanted to point that out here as well. All right, jumping into um, the more technical side where we're actually looking in and getting information um, from the system. So uh, one of the areas that we're, when we're looking at least privilege security that we want to get to is uh, we want to be able to go to a particular form in the system or, or you know, a particular page in the system and be able to figure out what menu items are tied to that page. And so the first thing that we're looking to do is to be able to get form information. So anything that you're looking at um, in the uh, when you go into the user interface is displayed to you in a form and that form is tied to a menu item display. And so you're able to get, if you can get that type of information, that menu item display is what you can actually assign to uh, a, a privilege and then assign that up the uh, security model to an actual user. Um, and so that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, when we're looking at from a least privilege perspective. So you can go into the user interface at any point, right click on a form and go to form information and out of the right hand side of the screen will come a uh, information page about that particular form that you're on. So it's going to give you information um, at the bottom here you can see that we're on the VIN table. You can see the menu item that's tied to that. So in this case the VIN table list page and you're able to see the menu item type which is display. Right, so you're able to get that type of information to actually be able to see uh, what type of information or what page you're on and it'll give you the information. So if you need very quickly to figure out, well, I need a user to have access to this page, you can get that information and be able to um, use that uh, to help you design your security. Uh, the other part to this um, is if you're signed in as a sysadmin or security admin, you're able to go to any page in the system, um, go into options. Under page options, there's a uh, menu item called uh, security diagnostics. Um, that security diagnostics, again, will allow you, if you click on it out of the right-hand side of the page, again, will come a window that will actually show you the roles, duties, and privileges that have access to that screen. So you're able to actually get an overview to say, these are the security layers that actually have access to this particular screen. Now, one thing I will note here is that it doesn't tell you what access that it has. So some of the access will be view access, some of it's actually going to be you know, edit, create, or delete. But you know that these are the objects that have access to this particular screen. Um, and so this screen actually allows you then to set up security through the screen as well. So depending on what security layer you are um, clicked on will depend on what the top um, options are. So if you're on a role, it'll say add roles to a user. If you're on a duty, it'll say add duty to a role. If you're on a privilege, it'll say add privilege to a duty. And so you can actually use that security diagnostic to actually help you set up security from there. Uh, one feature that was missing for a very long time uh, and is actually still missing out of the box uh, by default, um, but uh, was this role test workspace. So in AX2012, in the security development tool, you had the ability to actually go in and uh, pick a particular role duty or privilege and launch a test workspace to see what that role duty or privilege had access to. Um, and that isn't um, available in the user interface and it's not available in the AOT by default uh, and going through a number of different form posts um, that we were a part of uh, there was a, um, a certain series of posts where a Microsoft engineer let slip that this was actually available you just had to know how to enable it um, and so if you do enable it there's an additional couple features that get uh, enabled along with um, with this feature set. Uh, one of those is called View with Role Set. And that View with Role Set actually allows you to now go forward and be able to select a number of different roles that you would like to uh, view together um, and actually launch a test workspace with those particular roles. Uh, so you don't get to go down to the duty or privilege level anymore. So you have to stick at the role level. But one thing you can do is you can run this for multiple roles, which you couldn't do in the previous versions. And you can pick a user 
that you would like to start with and actually change the roles that they're assigned um, you know, as a scenario that you want to walk through and be able to see what would happen if you remove a particular role or add a role to a user uh, without having to you know, uh, actually go and uh, change their assignments manually and, and go through the system that way. A um, couple things to note with this is that um, a test user does get created in your system, so you'll actually see that in your user list as you go through. It'll start with a dollar sign. It'll be four characters long. Um, so just to keep that in mind. And when you're running this, you do have to assign the system user role to the user. Otherwise, um, it will fail because the first page it tries to load is the default dashboard. Um, so you have to have that system user assigned. Um, and I go into more information about this on my blog, so there's um, about how to install the, the Visual Studio extension to actually get that to show up. So um, if there's questions about that, um, at the end we can um, go into that in more detail. But um, this does exist now. It's existed since, uh, I want to say, platform update about 8 or 9-ish. Uh, somewhere in there, um, but again, you, it's not there by default. You still have to go and add that in. All right, so um, the final piece that we're going to use as we walk through from a technical standpoint actually developing security is the task recorder, and this is actually the main piece that we're going to use. Um, so the task recorder, uh, for those who haven't used it, is a piece of functionality that allows you to actually, as the name describes, record a particular process that a user does in the user interface. And it's normally used for recording step-by-step -step instructions uh, uh, or creating test cases um, from a testing perspective. Um, but one of the side effects is that it also allows you to, um, while the user is actually performing these tasks, it's also capturing the security objects needed to have the user be able to perform these tasks. And so we're able to take the output of these task recordings um, and look at them and be able to determine um, what security objects the user actually needs, and, and then using that be able to determine what security we either have to change or set up for a user to be able to be able to perform those tasks. So um, we're kind of using the task recorder not for its original purpose, but we're using it to um, extending the, the use case of it to actually help us set up security. So to actually get to it, um, in the upper right-hand corner, um, every any user that's assigned um, system user should have access to this. Um, this task recorder object, they should be able to go up to the gear in the upper right-hand corner, go to task recorder. Um, again, out of the right-hand side of the screen, the task recorder button will, uh, or the, the menu will come up and you'll be able to name the task recording. Now, once you start it, the screen will, uh, you'll see a big record button come up um, and you'll actually be able to walk through the steps um, and then you'll be able to see things like, you know, you went to accounts payable, you clicked on vendors, all vendors, and it'll actually list out every time you clicked on the screen, it'll list out the steps that you took. And then at the end, you're able to actually decide, well, how do I want to export this? So you can save it as a Word document, you can save it to Lifecycle Services as a business process, or you can save it as a developer recording, and that's how we're actually going to use this um, for our purposes today to be able to um, be able to get the menu items from it. So again, Microsoft has um, a feature called the Security Diagnostic for Task Recordings, which does exactly what we just described. So it takes the output of those task recordings and allows you to uh, take them um, and be able to go and see the menu items that are actually being used um, in that particular task recording. Uh, so uh, one additional feature that you can do here, again, is that you can run it against a user and be able to see what the access, uh, if that user has access to that object. Now again, it's not going to look to see if they have the correct access. It's just going to see whether or not they have access to that object. So it's not going to be able to see if they have read access and they should have create access. It's not going to be able to show you that, but it'll say whether or not the user has access to that object. Um, and the security diagnostic for task recordings is found under system administration security diagnostic for task recordings. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Frank to take a look at the auditing side uh, before we look at a user uh, scenario for this. Great. Thanks, Alex. And certainly, 
uh, folks see the word audit and sometimes they get a little bit apprehensive or a little bit uh, concerned and, and, and we like to, to touch upon this because a couple of reasons. One, um, even if you're not being audited, let's say you don't have an internal audit department or you're, you're not publicly traded or listed, um, the items that auditors are looking for are still important. Controls are still important in any organization. Certainly their controls around security and the assignment thereof are as well. Uh, but um, from an audit perspective and, and the auditors we work with, uh, being an auditor myself, less is more is normally a, a good way to look at things. And obviously the concepts Alex is covering today around least privilege fit upon that. Um, uh, starting with that and, and least privilege tied to the job function. And certainly that's something in most organizations, if you're large enough, uh, hopefully you can you can accommodate that. And we certainly realize in some cases, smaller shops um, uh, don't have as many people in a given department. There may be some segregation duty conflicts, but uh, the auditors like to see you applying the, the concept least pro privilege for each job function. Uh, and they also like to, to see if you can eliminate or try to minimize the amount of cross business process access users have. In today's world of many, many systems, you might have a CRM system, an HR system, an accounting system, um, Dynamics 365 could do all of those, but a lot of a lot of customers have a different different solutions for each of those. Um, you could you could actually introduce some cross process uh, business process uh, challenges, some exposure, some SOB conflicts, segregation duty conflicts with that. So auditors like to see you really try to to eliminate or at least have less cross business pro process access for your user base. Um, Third one there, and this is one auditors always ask about, even if they know nothing about dynamics, they know how to ask who has elevated privileges, who has sysadmin rights. Um, so having the least amount of users as possible that require sysadmin for their uh, daily job function uh, is something you should try to follow. If you do need to give elevated or sysadmin privileges to someone uh, as a, a one-off opportunity just in time or emergency access, that needs to be tightly controlled with the assignment and review of the assignment and, and turning that on and off uh, a period of time that's agreed to. Um, and then the last one here we like to throw in here as well is less is better in all these cases, except for the last one, when it comes to user access reviews. The auditors are going to ask you, and if they aren't, it's a good business process to have, is that for your critical business processes and the data that resides in those systems that support it, someone should periodically be reviewing the user access around that data and those systems. Uh, maybe it's once a quarter, maybe it's once a month. Uh, you determine based on the risk level uh, of the, that data to your organization and do those user access reviews. So in the case of user access reviews, the auditor would say doing more of those is a good thing. Uh, but in all the other three cases, uh, less is better from our perspective. Uh, again, uh, I like to remind folks as we speak a lot about auditing and preparing for the audit that if the auditor feels confident that you can explain what you're doing, the methodology you've deployed, the concepts that support the methodology and the, the processes you have internally to meet that methodology, uh, they're going to be more comfortable. And, and talk to them about how you deploy a concept of least privilege and less is better concepts when it comes to accessing the systems and individual users and their roles is something auditors like to hear and will give them more confidence in what you have constructed uh, inside your company. And then uh, finally, the, the next slide I have here from an audit perspective uh, that, that we like to touch upon uh, gets into the fact that if you're audited, uh, good chances the auditors don't know as much about D365 as you might think they know. Um, the concept of least privilege I understand at a high level, but how that can actually be deployed for what Alex is showing today, that knowledge is not there yet. It is growing. Um, some of the things natively where some of the gaps are in D365, FNO, around SOD and the like, uh, they're starting to pick up on. Uh, but in reality, uh, from the folks we talk to, the audit firms we work with, the folks I talk to that have been through audits, um, they're still having pretty generic audit programs, very basic questions of show me who has uh, access to elevator privileges like I mentioned before. Uh, give me a list of the uh, last 30 people who use your access forms you had to process. They don't get down into the details of how AX security works. They may say, uh, show me who has access to AP very high level requests, but they don't actually then know how to even read a report you might provide back to them. Uh, so uh, don't assume they understand what you're explaining. This gets back to what I mentioned before. If you have a process in place, methodology that supports it, you've done a risk-based approach around your business processes. If you can build that story as you explain to the auditors the reports you're now reviewing with them, they're going to have a level of confidence. Don't assume just handing them a report is enough. We always tell folks we work with that walk them through that report, explain them to how it works inside Dynamics. Um, actually, for any system for that matter, 
help them build confidence in you as you walk them through that report. Um, if they if they understand and they see that the confidence you're showing and the level of understanding and knowledge, they're likely to move on to other areas, maybe not spend as much time, quote, perform audit testing in the area you're reviewing with them. Uh, but uh, their knowledge is gaining, but it's still not there yet compared to other systems like SAP, Oracle, and the like. So um, uh, that's just something to know. Don't, don't make some assumptions. They do have limited knowledge. Um, some of the stuff we'll cover later on SOD, they're starting to pick up on those flaws natively in the product. But overall, um, try to control the situation. Show your knowledge. Have a business process approach based around risk assessments and a methodology that supports all that. And you should be uh, in a better better position to uh, handle the type of inquiries you have and, and get through an audit. And even if you don't get audited, uh, the concepts that these, these apply to preparing for an audit would still apply to your own organization to make you feel better about the controls you have in place and support your internal control structure. All right, Alex, I'll hand it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Frank. So we're going to look at a actual user scenario now. So um, this is uh, an actual uh, scenario that occurred um, on the AXA user group forum from Dynamics Communities, um, and a user posted this uh, question out. Uh, so they were looking for a role to add or edit customer addresses, but they wanted view access to all of their customer master data. Um, and so they had tried a couple things at first, um, and so uh, before asking the question, um, they had tried doing uh, granting inquiry into customer master duty with the additional privilege of maintaining customer delivery addresses, uh, but the address field still remained view only. Uh, next, they tried granting the maintain customer master duty to the role and then restricting the table by setting certain fields to view in the override permission screen, which also didn't work as fields on the customer record remain editable. Um, and so at this point, uh, they reached out, um, and I happened to see this. Uh, and so this is the uh, process that I went through to actually um, help them um, develop their lease privilege for this particular scenario. Uh, so the first thing I did is I went to each of the individual screens. Um, and so I went to the individual um, customer screen, um, then the logistics uh, to the address screen, um, and got the um, form information as well as the menu item information for each of the screens. So the first one, the first uh, form information there is from the individual customer. Um, so you're able to see that the menu item in the cus table list page. Uh, so that's at the actual customer's um, page that I went to. The next one is from editing, editing the address. So I actually opened up the edit address um, uh, feature uh, and grabbed the form information there. Um, and that actually has a menu item called Custer Party Postal Address Edit. Um, and I did the same thing for the new site. So actually adding in um, the, a new address. So that would be the Custer Party Postal Address New. So I have, now I have the actual page where the customer resides. I have the adding and editing of an address. And then the final piece of this was that there was um, a form, the Logistics Postal Address Grid form that the address lived on. Um, and there was a menu item that actually tied to that form, and I needed um, that particular piece uh, to be able to uh, give ad access to. So I had to work backwards instead of going from the menu item to the form. I had to go from the form to the menu item. So in this case, I had to go from logistic filter. I just grid and do a lookup backwards to the um, the menu item for that. Um, and so uh, those were the four pieces that I needed in this case. Um, so this would be the more manual route to go if you were going and actually looking up individually. The easier route, in my mind, is to actually take um, task recordings. So on the next screen is what I actually did. I took two separate task recordings. I went in and actually went to the screen and edited an address. And the second screen, I went in and created a new address. And so you'll notice that in the first screen, I have the cus table list page the logistic postal address grid form part, which is that missing menu item that I had on the first screen that I had to do the lookup from the form. And then the last one was with the edit side of the customer party postal address edit, and then for adding an address is the customer party postal address new. Right? And so the combination of these um, is the actual solution to the, the uh, process for this.
Um, so obviously um, this is a, probably the process that I would recommend going for and, and why I, I pointed uh, and why I stressed using a tax recorder function for this is because you're able to get, especially with the security diagnostic uh, for tax recording feature, you're able to get that visual output to show you the menu items uh, that are being used. Uh, one additional piece for this is I actually created um, a tool that does this exact thing um, prior to Microsoft adding it, um, and so it's still available on uh, my GitHub at, um, at the link there for Test Recorder Parser. Uh, one additional feature is that one, it does form, it actually gives you the form name as well, um, and two, it actually does AX2012 test recordings, um, which there is no tool out there uh, available to do that from Microsoft. So it'll do finance and operations task recordings as well as AX2012 task recordings. So if you're looking for that, um, the link will be available there as well. Um, it's on my GitHub uh, and available for free to download. But the user scenario in this case um, was the following. We went view permission to the CUS table list page, um, update permission to the customer party postal address edit, and then new or create permissions to um, the customer party postal address, new, and then the logistics postal address grid form part. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, we basically were able to keep all of our security uh, at the menu item level. And for those who have done security in Anx 2012, you may be wondering, well, where are your data sources? Why are you not having to set up any data sources for this? Um, and so the following slide actually gets into why that is, but I just wanted to point out on the right-hand side here, this is actually a screenshot within Dynamics 365 of me um, assigned the, uh, I created a privilege uh, of this exact solution, assigned it to a role, and then launched it with that role, uh, view with role test workspace, um, or view with role set, and actually was able to show that um, when I go to a customer now, I'm not able to delete anything, but I am able to come down and actually see the add and edit on the address side. So the solution that we're using here with just these four pieces is able to get you the solution that the customer is looking for. So instead of assigning the entire duty of maintain customer and restricting it down or inquiry into customer and then trying to grant more privileges, you can grant these four pieces and get you the information that you're looking for. All right, so the question then we come back to is why is in X2012 do you have to go down to the data source and assign permission there, where in 365 you do not? And this is one of the another big change in security from X2012 to 365, and it all comes back to entry point security. Um, and so if we're looking at entry point security, uh, Basically, in AX2012, there was no tie between the menu item access you were coming to a form with and the table permission that you were actually getting. What actually was occurring is that if you had one menu item um, when you accessed a form, if you had multiple menu items accessing a form, the security framework would look across and say, hey, what's the maximum permission that this uh, user has to this form? And it would grant that permission uh, to the user to the actual data sources behind it. So you could come to a form with read permission and actually get access um, to the data sources at a delete level. Uh, and so you could have a mismatch, right? Um, and that mismatch would uh, manifest itself in the fact that you would come to the form in a read permission. And because your um, command buttons are tied to your data source access, you would have things like the delete button would light up or other buttons on the menu bar would light up. Uh, because you have delete access to the to the data source, and that's what the command buttons are tied to. Um, and so this would actually uh, come up in a number one a number of our clients' uh, scenarios because users couldn't figure out how these users were getting access to these objects, and it's because of this. Um, in 365, Microsoft decided that they were going to fix this, and so um, now um, whatever access you come to the form with the menu item access that you get is going to be applied to the data sources behind that form. So if you come to read, come to the form with read access um, on the menu item, you're going to have read access to all the data sources behind it, right? And so because of that, because Dynamics 365 is honoring the menu item permissions to the data sources, 
you really don't have to worry about assigning data source security anymore because your menu item access is actually uh, basically taking care of that now. So as long as your menu item access is correct, um, and, and there are specific situations where you would have to go to the um, uh, data source uh, and actually you know, assign or change the permissions, but in most cases you're able to just put your security at the menu item level and um, continue to um, um, you know, setting up your security and you don't have to go down to that that uh, data source level and so that makes setting up security and finance and operations much easier um, because you're only dealing with one layer uh, of having to get the one layer of the menu item correct and not multiple layers with the data source. All right, so with that, um, I did want to show um, quickly, let's see if I can do this, um, just a couple things that I had talked about. Um, so we're going to quickly jump into uh, finance and operations here um, and just kind of run through um, some of the uh, features that I had talked about. Uh, so the first is under security configuration, I'm able to come in and actually uh, be able to run that uh, view access uh, view permissions report for any of the roles, user or privileges out of the box. So I'm able to come in and be able to actually see um, what access this particular, let's run it for, apologize there. Um, what the roles, user, privileges have access to, um, should be able to. So you're able to come in and actually be able to see that, there we go, the roles, duties, privileges, resource type, so this is the type of object that it is, the resource itself, so this is the name, um, and then it obviously keeps extending to the um, horizontally here, so you have your read, update, create, delete, correct, invoke, so those are different access types, and then the license if it's required or applicable to that object. Um, so this report, again, is uh, was not out of, available out of the box from AX 2012, um, but it is available from uh, in finance and operations. Um, and you also get the license type required overall for this particular um, access as well. Um, if I go to any page now, so if, for example, if I go to this All Vendors page, I'm able to come in and be able to um, go to that security, um, that page options up at the top and be able to see the roles, duties, and privileges that are actually being affected uh, by my, or have access to this particular page. Mm -hmm. So I'd be able to uh, be able to see the roles, duties, and privileges. So on the options page, I have the security diagnostics. I can go ahead and click this. On the, on the right hand side here are going to be the roles, duties, and privileges that have access to this screen. Um, now, depending on if I'm selected to a particular role, up here at the top, you're going to see add roles to a user, right, because I'm, I'm currently selecting on a role. If I come down and actually select a duty up here at the top, it's now going to change to add duties to a role. If I select a privilege, it's going to select add privileges to a duty, right? And so um, you can actually use this process, if you would like, to actually help you set up security that way. All right, and finally, uh, from within the user interface here, we have the ability to do that task recording that I talked about. So again, over here on the right-hand side, um, we can go ahead and create a recording. Let's call it demo. Uh, once we start this, um, you're going to notice that the entire screen is going to change here. This over here on the right-hand side is going to stay. This is where the tasks are actually going to build up. Um, at the top here, you're going to notice that there's a record icon and then the name of the recording. Uh, now I can go through and actually, if I wanted to jump back into that um, all vendors page, right? Um, now I can actually go through and say, okay, you went to accounts payable, vendors, all vendors, and it'll actually walk me through the entire process as I click through here. So every click that I'm going to make would actually be written over here on this uh, this side. Um, once I'm done, I can go ahead and hit stop, and then this is the screen where I can decide what I would like to do with that recording. Um, again, if I wanted to use that um, uh, security diagnostic for task recordings, I'd have to save it as a developer recording. Um, so once I'm done there, um, if I did want to use that security diagnostic for task recordings, 
Um, that's available under System Administration Security. Um, so if I come to this screen, uh, the first thing it's going to ask you for is for a file. So I have a demo file here, which is actually the same file that is being used um, in our um, example. So you'll notice that the four um, pieces uh, or menu items that we're using in our example show up here. And so now um, you'll so it quickly obviously shows you the, the objects that were used in that task recording. And then again, we're able to come in and be able to see, okay, what user, um, you know, if we select a user, it'll show you if they're missing that permission or not. So a blank row means that they have access to it. Otherwise, it'll say yes um, if they're missing that permission. All right. And then from an AOT perspective, let me go ahead and bring this over really quick. I just wanted to show what the view with World Test Workspace looks like. So um, I created, like I've mentioned, I created a test role for this uh, for our particular scenario. So if I come with to that uh, D3 Dynamics 365 add-ins and I go to View with Role Set, um, I created an FP demo role which is contains the, the objects that I was um, referring to, and those four different permissions um, at the levels that we talked about. If I go ahead and click OK here, this should open up a new um, Dynamics 365 window um, and have it just be assigned the permissions that we, we are within that, those two roles. Uh, and we should be able to uh, perform the task that um, we should be able to go back to that screen that, of the screenshot I took. So let me go to an actual company that actually has. Uh, customers in it here. And now when I come to this customer page, and again, I'm, this is as if I'm assigned that, F, that um, role that has those, um, those menu items assigned to it. So this would be what the user would, would see if they were assigned that particular role. Um, so once we get to that the screen here with the customers, we'll open up a customer and we'll be able to see that this particular user does not have access to actually update in any way, either create a new customer, update a customer, uh, delete a customer, uh, but they do have permission to actually add or edit a particular um, the account uh, or the uh, address behind it. So if we open up a particular um, customer here, you'll see that the edit and delete buttons are grayed out, but the add and edit buttons for the addresses are lit up, and I'm able to go in and actually edit these or add a new one if I would like. Right, So I have full control over the addresses, but I have just the necessary, I don't have any permission to the actual customer master record. So it's exactly the, the it meets the requirements that the customer is asking for. All right. So the steps that we're taking when we're looking at implementing least privilege security, uh, one is to determine the task user will perform. Uh, that's the first step, right? Um, you need to determine what these users are actually going to be doing in the system. You want to make sure that you're not over-provisioning users, obviously, for the, 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 the um, for what we've already currently, you know, talked about as far as you know the environmental risks, the licensing impact, and the SOD risk from that. Um, we have a security matrix from uh, FastPath can assist with this process as far as going through and seeing what uh, you know if you want this user to be able to do these things. Here's the roles and duties you need to assign. Um, so that's um, available uh, from FastPath for free. Um, you can isolate menu items. Uh, for process and task, that's the next step is you need to find out which menu items are actually being used for a particular task or process. And so that's where that task recorder comes into play. Um, so you can perform the task the user will need to, be, uh, need to do while recording it with that task recorder function and then using either the task recorder parser or that security diagnostic for task recordings in finance and operations um, to extract that menu items used uh, or consumed during the task recording itself. And then uh, the next step is determine the correct permissions for the menu items. Uh, remembering that the menu item security is honored at the table level, so you don't have to go down to that table level unless you have a particular need to. 
Um, and if you'd like additional help with this, we have the FastPath Security Designer module, which actually will, um, based on um, you know the, act, the, the processes that you're doing, it actually will determine the access that you need for each menu item for you, so you don't have to go through and actually determine that yourself, uh, along with other features as well. Um, if necessary, you can modify the table level access to allow restrict access to certain fields. I would say this is more for restricting access. So if you want users to not be able to perform a particular task in finance and operations using that or the explicit deny that is um, apparent or available within 365, um, that would be the, the process you would take there. Um, and then obviously always test and validate. Uh, always be sure to test your solution prior to deployment. Um, your security should follow the same process that your code is going through. So you should be going through the same deployment process, the same testing process that your code is. Um, and one thing we always say is that users will not complain if they have too much access, right? And so you're never going to hear somebody come to you and say, hey, I have access to click this button and I don't think I should. All right, so just to finish up, some common security challenges um, that we see. Um, and this is across ERPs, it's not specific to finance and operations or AX or Dynamics, it's, this is across um, all ERPs. Um, but access security is low priority for the project team, especially if you're looking at implementations, new implementations or re-implementing security or, or you know, any, any process to this where um, there's, a, there's a large push um, and, and unless you're actually doing the, the project itself is to re-implement security, if the project is, uh, you know, to implement a new uh, feature or a new um, uh, re-implement ERP in general, um, normally access security is not a part of that plan. And so access security gets pushed down to the very bottom or the last thing. Um, and so that leads into the second bullet point where everyone is a sciences admin, right? Everyone just gets full access because um, instead of going through and setting up security correctly, uh, security was granted, um, it was just wide open um, because, um, you know, users weren't able to perform their day-to-day -day operations unless they were a sciences admin. Uh, the third bullet point is big um, that we see is that a lot of companies will try to, um, you know, put security in the domain of IT sysadmins and not business process owners. Um, and while that may make sense in theory, the IT sysadmins know how to change security, but they have no idea what a user should have access to do. Your business process owners know what the user should have access to do, but don't either have the rights or the technical wherewithal to be able to go in and actually perform that. And so there has to be a cross um, uh, communication between these two groups to be able to say, here's what the user should have access to do, and then have your IT sysadmin actually go and do that. Um, some companies try to put expensive customizations in place of security. So instead of setting up security correctly, they'll go and try to customize either the UI or the back end to fit their particular security needs. Um, and obviously that is um, very hard to maintain and not recommended. Um, there's no consideration for segregation of duties where you're looking at um, you know, you develop all of your security for a functional perspective um, and um, you don't think about, well, should this user be able to, to perform both of these processes um, as part of the security? Um, and Microsoft is guilty of this too with their out-of-the-box security. Um, uh, the roles that they deliver, duties and privileges out-of-the-box are not segregation of duties compliant by any means, um, just because they went and at it from a functional perspective that they wanted to make sure that users could perform tasks and they didn't look at it from a segregation duties perspective. Um, along with that, the process controls are not part of the design. So along with the fact that you should be developing and keeping in mind segregation of duties, you should be developing new process controls for where there are segregation of duties that you can't uh, mediate uh, or remediate immediately. Um, through you know changing security that where a user to, is going to have to perform both of these processes that you have some process control to put in place and so you want to make sure that your process controls are also a part of your security design um, and then you can do everything right up until you go live and have everything be okay um, but if you're not um, you know if you don't 
do periodic reviews on, and if you're not going back through and revalidating security, you're going to have the dilution of GoLi security where people are granted security but never revoked it because they're covering for somebody else or they have to do this one thing for one time um, and security never gets revoked because, like we mentioned, users never complain about having too much access. Um, so you um, might have your security perfect when you go live, but if you're not going through and reviewing that security, your um, that security is going to um, eventually not be um, you know, as um, perfect as it was when you went live with it. And that leads into the reviewing security that we, um, the final slide here that we talk about where we're looking and saying, you know, when, you're, when you are going through and reviewing security, you want to take a risk-based approach to your reviews. Uh, don't try to tackle all of your user access at once. Um, go through and take high risk areas of finance and operations and review those. Um, you know, define those areas and actually say who has access to these high risk areas. Don't try to just say who has access to everything uh, because that's going to, you know, extremely um, expand your, your uh, the amount of space you're trying to, uh, or the amount of rows you're looking at. So take a risk-based approach, focus in on those areas, and be able to report very quickly on who has access to those high-risk areas in your system. Um, monitor and report both of those on user access. So um, if you have these reports and nobody's actually reviewing those reports, it doesn't do any good. So you want to make sure that you have somebody looking at the reports that you're outputting. Um, business process owners should review that access, again, because they know where users should have access. Um, so having IT sysadmin look at those is, is not um, not enough. And then you need to be able to update process controls and segregation duties rules to reflect, reflect security changes. So as your process changes within your business, as security changes, as you add new ISVs that are third-party apps or customizations in your system, you have to update process controls and SOD rules to reflect those security changes. Um, so you want to make sure that um, those are a part of your security uh, change management as well. All right, and finally we have just a couple of resources. Um, we have a, a resource page of all of our finance and operations um, white papers and, and all of the blogs that we write at FastPath. Are, again, those are um, strictly educational that, that we have there. I have my own personal blog, which is, again, strictly educational about um, you know, the differences in finance and operations in AX2012 uh, that I've, that I've uh, came across. Um, the information about the tax recorder itself, documentation from Microsoft, um, my GitHub projects for the tax recorder parser, the security matrix. Um, the, Frank mentioned this earlier, but we did a, a security and duties analysis comparison between um, how FastPath looks at that and how Microsoft looks at that um, and the gaps that, that auditors are looking for there. Um, and so that's available on FastPath as well. Um, Frank and I um, and a couple others from FastPath put together a book about the security audit uh, field manual for finance and operations. So the, both from a technical and audit perspective, how to set up security and why you would set it up that way. Um, and then this entire um, PowerPoint is also available in a white paper if you would like as well. So at this point, we'll go ahead and take any questions. Again, my information is here as well as Frank's um, and link from my blog. Um, but we'll go ahead and take any questions that have came up during the, the demo here today or the presentation today. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um, so, yeah, we do have a bunch of questions that came in. Uh, and once again, for those of you that have not submitted questions, please feel free to do so uh, if you'd like to uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so, Alex, I'll just start fielding these okay. as they come in. Um, so uh, we have a question. So someone's asking about the task record and yep. if that is the same as the security entry point permissions in 2012. Uh, so the task, I'm assuming they mean task recorder. Um, I, the task, I, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Um, so the task recorder would track, um, the security entry point permissions would be your menu items, um, would be an entry point within um, AX2012. Uh, so it would track, um, basically, the task recorder is looking at that entry point level to say where uh, users are getting access at the entry point level. It does not go any deeper than that to say, here's the data sources behind it. So, and if 
it works the same way in AX2012 as it does in 365 from that perspective. Okay. Someone's asking if D365 supports record level security. Uh, no, that's been um, deprecated and replaced by XDS, the extensible data security. Uh, all right, here's the next question. Um, I'm not sure which specific process this person is talking about, but it says, a uh, question about this process. In the example, you created privileges for the menu items, but did you assign them to duties or to the role directly? So in my example, um, I created a privilege out of it and just assigned it to a role just to get a, um, a so I could run it and actually have output. Um, in a true real world scenario, you would probably want to assign that to a duty, have the duty assigned to a role, have the role assigned to a user. Um, but in my particular case, because I wanted to get output, I assigned it directly to a role. And this same person actually has a follow-up. Um, it would be nice to identify existing duties and roles that can achieve what we want as opposed to creating customizations. Is there an easy way to do this? <laughs> uh, yeah, the FastPass Security Designer does that for you. Um, I, there's not a tool out of the box that's going to allow you to do that. Um, you'd have to go in and compare those manually. Um, there are third-party tools um, that um, I was actually, uh, I was the lead developer on that P or the security developer and developer um, from um, FastPath, and so um, that's actually one of the, the pieces that we provide for that um, is being able to take a task recording and see what current out of the box security does it match up against. Um, so you're not always creating new security, but from the out of the box functionality from Microsoft natively, there's nothing that's going to get you to that point. You would have to manually go in and, and uh, compare that access against what the current role duty and privilege security is. Someone's asking if we'll be sharing a copy of this presentation. Um, yes, the answer is uh, we have recorded this session um, and you can actually find it in the new MS Dynamics World video library, uh, which we actually just recently launched on the site. So it'll be in there uh, probably the next day or so. Um, looks like we do have a bunch more questions. So uh, okay. someone's asking what happens with the task recorder when the recording user has uh, system administrative privileges? Does it look at whether menu items show if they are not used? Uh, yeah, so the, the task recording, when I made those task recordings, I was signed in as sysadmin. So it's only looking at ta or it's only looking at menu items that you click on. So not everything that you can view, just what you click on. So that's, um, it, it doesn't matter what security you're logged in as, it just depends on what object you're clicking on. Uh, here's another question. When we use sub-roles on a custom role um, on a new version update from Microsoft, will the sub-role be automatically linked to the custom role with any updated functionality? Um, so are they... I, I'm trying to figure out, are they saying that they created a custom role where the out-of-the-box roles are the sub roles to the custom role? That's a good question. I'm not sure they, they didn't specify. Okay, so if they are if they have a custom role where they assigned out of the box security to it as a sub role, then the answer is yes. And then out of the box, if Microsoft updates one of the sub, if Microsoft updates one of the out of the box roles, then um, any, obviously any role where it is a sub role would get updated. Um, if um, I guess that would be the only scenario where it would get updated automatically. Any other time, it would not. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we actually don't have any more questions coming in. Um, but uh, once again, Alex and Frank, your info is up on the site. So if people do have questions, uh, I'm sure they will contact you offline. Um, anyways, once again, Alex and Frank, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to uh, present to our members today. That was great. 
Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, the members that um, attended this session. Hope you found it useful. And as I mentioned, um, we'll be following up uh, in the next day or so uh, with a link to view the on-demand webcast. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.